find themselves in opposition to Russian imperialism. We are talking about countries like Georgia and Ukraine. This is obviously more concern in these countries in comparison to countries like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan for obvious reasons. But why do they do that? They do that because the pain is recent and the scars are still healing. For countries like Hungary and the states that make up the former state of Czechoslovakia, the Russians destroyed these countries in recent memory. They are still rebuilding and reconstructing their countries from scratch since the 1950s. And what they do then, because the hurt is still so recent and still so painful, is that they find ways and means to define themselves in opposition to Russia. And this includes the rich Slavic nationalist history that they have and share in common. It stretches beyond hundreds and hundreds of years, but they find it important because of their recent pain. We stand for the side that said believes that these countries should break free from the shadows of hurt that Russia has cast upon them and to function as states that understand and embrace the realities of realpolitik in the context of a world of an increasingly assertive Russia who tries to push above its weight even though it's no longer an economic powerhouse and in a world where the United States threatens to pull out from all the existing and traditional arrangements it has across the world. But what do we mean by define itself? It's very simple. They look back at the rich history that they have and they share with their Russian neighbors and they try and squeeze that out and not discuss that as much and instead discuss what's unique about the individual countries, the unique history of Georgia, the unique history of Ukraine. But what we say, and what I'm going to make good later on in my speech, is that this has real effects on policy as well. Because once you stretch your hands so far deep into history, that has an impact on the actual policies that are enacted by the parliaments of these countries, that you necessarily have to define yourself as anti-Russia. I'll be talking about a couple of things. <laughs> Firstly, uh, the point about why exactly this is uh, needed by these countries so they can negotiate the relationship between themselves, Russia and the United States and why that's necessary. Secondly, I'll be talking about why uh, this is important because you need to also address the needs of the ethnic Russian minorities that you find in huge sways in these countries and why that's important. But first, let's talk about why this is necessary as a measure of real politics in the world that we live today. We find an increasingly imperialistic Russia today. There not, might not be imperial Russia, but the way Vladimir Putin conducts himself and the way Dmitry Medvedev then carries out the daily functions of the Russian administration, they are akin to an imperial Russia. There are echoes of that that you find in the world today. They also, but, and, and, but here's the thing, the way they conduct themselves, the way they try to focus on things like cyber attack to reassert their position in the world shows that they are mean, they mean business in interrupting the functioning democracies of other countries. The way they conduct their relations with other countries as well suggests that they are trying to push above their weight. So what these guys do is that having to find themselves in opposition to Russia for so long and realizing that the hurt that has been caused that has a natural impact on the kind of policies that they enact today as well. Because they don't want to be hurt again. Because they realize that if they are going to be hurt, then there will be massive questions that have to be answered. Questions that they cannot answer unless they oppose Russia. That's why we see countries like the main administration in Kiev being so stridently anti-Russia than the way they deal with the uh, relationships with the Putin administration. But let's set this in context. Even before Donald Trump came in and completely messed up the world, the U.S. was completely unpredictable anyway. And at this point, I'm going to say the U.S. and NATO as one entity. Several arguments for that, but I guess for the purpose of reasonable debate, let's just take that to be true. Georgia made a gamble in the early 2010s with the invasion of Abkhazia when they relied on NATO possibly coming in to repel the Russian forces that came in. Nobody came to their rescue. And what these new states, that formerly were satellite states of the Federation uh, uh, of the USSR, need to realize is that they cannot rely on any other country for their well-being or for their survival. What we need to do is ensure that they care about policies that protect themselves. But this requires a Russia that's willing to play ball, right? A Russia that might have find it within them, the largest to help these countries, and we think there is. The way that Russia helps the Commonwealth Independent States, the organization of the Commonwealth Independent States, who are willing to deal with Russia on normal terms, on amicable terms, shows that Russia is willing to play ball with you if you don't push back too hard on everything that they do with you. So when you balance the relationship between Russia and the United States, what does that do? Does that make you a client state of Russia? No, it doesn't. But what it gives you is the space to push back on certain things that you think is going to harm you, Right? And then move closer to the United States. And vice versa as well, when you realize that you need to rely on Russia, which by the way still has very tangible links with Eastern Russia, uh, Eastern Europe, through you know, the provision of oil and gas, 
through, for example, the markets of trade that you find in these countries. The next question we have is, how about alternatives? Why not China? Well, we think that the Belt Road Initiative, while awesome, is, is massively bad for the countries they are engaged in. Let's look at Sri Lanka, where they were caught in a massive debt trap and had to sell the land for the main port in the northern part of the Jaffna province to China because they can't pay back that debt. We don't think this is a situation that you want the Eastern European countries to find themselves in. We think it's better that they deal with what's within the control and try to negotiate the balance between Russia and the United States. Secondly, the reality is in the eastern part of the Ukraine, in Georgia, there are massive swings of ethnic Russian minorities. If you define yourself constantly in opposition to Russian imperialism, if you try to distance yourself from Russia at every given opportunity, these people will feel excluded. They will feel like that they do not belong. And why is that bad? The annexation of Crimea gives us a primary text, for example, where the ethnic Russian minorities didn't think it was as much of a problem that their region was being invaded by Russia. In fact, they were willing to support the little green men who came in. In fact, they were willing to say that no, these aren't Russian forces. You've got to get them on side. But you cannot get them on side when you say thousands upon thousands of years of shared history with Russia is something that we want to forget. But more importantly, it deprives oxygen from some democratic movements that are ethnic Russian. For example, the Maidan movement in the Ukraine, which was pushing back against the corruption of the Kiev administration, but eventually fell through because of accusations of being in bed with Russia. That these are the problems that come in when we create a situation that's so toxic for people who could potentially be identified as Russian and we think this is a massive problem. And for these reasons, Madam Speaker, I'm extremely proud to propose. Thank you. 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 That destroys your ability to negotiate your identity and construct your identity in other, better ways that could potentially lead to you examining your own history with the market for life. That would be the basis of my extension. Before that, a few points of mind. Firstly, geopolitics, which really should be the focus of this debate, but which we spend that generally the later time on. Firstly, this idea that Russia is actually in the economic doldrums and they can't enact that much, that much harm to these countries. That's just not true, right? They admit themselves that Russia has the ability to cut off Russian oil to Ukraine, which is their main source of oil. They have the ability to invade when they feel threatened enough. So we think the first move is to ensure that understanding that Russia is a threat on the ground and that the United States is no longer reliable, we need to seek a new accommodation with Russia. And that means not throwing away thousands of years of shared history, both painful and cooperative at the same time. But let's come to the larger issue, the idea that Russia is terrible and so therefore we need to construct identity in opposition to this new imperial Russia. Like first and foremost, this misses the nuance in what you mean in my speech. That Russia is not China. It's precisely because Russia is both strong, is economically weak, but militarily strong, that they are willing to accommodate if that state is willing to accommodate them as well. That is why relationships with, with the relationship with places like Kazakhstan and with Uzbekistan are largely peaceful, precisely because an accommodation has been sought. However, because of recent Russian history, because of the 20 million dead in the Great, Great Patriotic War, because in the post years and how the Western Union neighbors came in and effectively ruined Russia, every time Russia feels that either Ukraine or Georgia is falling towards the West, that's when they turn aggressive. That's when they threaten to cut off Russian oil. That's when they might potentially even invade. So in this circumstance, the nuance of our case, in our case, is not that we should always become a Russian client state, but it must be politically possible within these countries for these states to accommodate Russia when they need to. And when your national identity is built around opposing both old and new Russian imperialism, it becomes politically untenable for you to ever accommodate Russia. Russia is a fact on the ground. Their case prevents our ability to negotiate with this fact on the ground. Moving on to the second point, the idea of national identity. That shared trauma is a good basis on which to build national identity. The first problem is this, and this is, this is part of everyone's case, is that this trauma is not equally shared, precisely because so many of these countries have deep historical ties with Russia and have their own Russian identities as well. These people do consider themselves Russian. They have ties with Kinch. They have relatives in Russia and Moscow. They share the same language. Places like Donetsk are effectively Russian. You can't survive there without Russia. They say that you can distinguish between the imperialism of Russia and the, cult and the cultural symbols of Russia. Point. That simply doesn't happen. To oppose Russian imperialism, you cannot then have Russian cultural symbols becoming part of your national identity or becoming part of the narrative. For this reason, inevitably, this policy will alienate your Russian minorities. And the proof simply lies in reality. There is a reason why Eastern Ukraine opposed the West, also opposed the minor movement in Kiev. There is a reason why Eastern Ukraine has been much more welcoming to Russian invasion than the West. I will take closing. 
So if Russian strategy is to force settlement in these countries so that there are more Russian population, yes. isn't it a good idea that they're slightly more wary of Russians settling around? Yeah. It's not forced settlement. Half of Ukraine is occupied by ethnic Russians who were born in Russia, whose ancestors were born in Russia, as well, whose ancestors were also born in Ukraine in cities like Donetsk. As well, the forced settlement is a minor issue compared to the three existing Russian minorities already in eastern Ukraine. But second, they claim that any new identity will not be real to places like Ukraine. That is not, not true because we are identity based on the lived realities now, based on language, based on food, based on thought, based on being a European state. Those are things that your citizens are currently living a daily, on a day-to-day -day basis. So they can feel it. You're constructing a new identity, but it can be constructed. The example here is Czechoslovakia. They only really began constructing their identity after the fall of, of, of communism in the East. They, formed, they, create, they effectively we have to reformulate their language in order to tie to the ancient past, and they have been incredibly successful in doing so. The last point that this, this form of identity construction promotes democracy. <laughs> that is simply untrue, because yeah. when any poor Russian policy or any attempt to negotiate and accommodate Imperial Russia is seen as a betrayal of your national identity, you make it possible for people who are anti-Russian to paint poor Russian people as fifth columnists as well. That is precisely what happened in Georgia when the government of Edward Shevardnadzer in 2010 saw anyone who attempted to accommodate Russia in regards to the Abzatia crisis as poor Russians, as traitors to Georgia as well. That is not conducive for the real for the, for the building of democracy. Any democracy that you build in, in, in Eastern Europe, in former Soviet states, must negotiate the inferior past of Russia, negotiate the possibility that at some point, peace with Russia must be necessary. For these reasons, the idea of identity construction doesn't stand. Uh, on the right extension, on uh, large issues of identity construction. On the first level, generally when states project their identity based on a fight with an oppressor or an enemy, it decreases the chance that they will examine their own conduct throughout history as well because they see themselves as the eternal good guys. That's what happened, for instance, between Armenia in, 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 in Armenia, for instance. So what this means is that Ukraine will not examine parts of their past, they may not be that part of the world to look at. Like the fact that many Ukrainians actually supported the Nazis and assisted the Nazis during the Holocaust and assisted them during the invasion of Russia. There actually was a Ukrainian brigade in the invasion of Russia during Operation Barbarossa. Likewise, Georgia was Stalin's hometown. They assisted, yeah. they, 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 Georgia, Georgia assisted in Stalin, Stalin's purges as well during the time the US is out. But when your identity is so maniacally focused on the oppressor without, you do not look at the oppressor within. You do not look at your own history as potential oppressors. This obviously, firstly, is principally wrong, but secondly, it prevents your ability to look at your own politics and ensure you don't fall back into that regressive past as well. So that is mightily important, and your policy prevents that. But second, we also think it prevents you from basing your identity on other things as well. Because generally speaking, the states that manage to move on from traumatic warlike past are able to base their identity on more more modern construction, like China, for instance, economic development, or Israel, the identity as well as the, start, the, the, the new start of nation, which is much better as a part of Israeli identity than what it is happening. So, the point here being, you prevent, Ukraine will always define itself in terms of its relationship with Imperial Russia. It will not define itself as Ukraine, the startup or the start -up, or Ukraine, the, the modern European nation that's able that, 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 you know, that, you know, that, you know, that, 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 yeah, the modern European nation. So all this basis, you prevent the ability of your country to negotiate their own history because they are forever trapped in the past, the, in, 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 in past oppression. That is vitally harmful to Ukrainian history and the Ukraine's ability to, like, to construct its own identity as well. For all these reasons, because Russia is a threat on the ground and their policy prevents any accommodation with Russia, because their policy is bad for identity construction in Russia, we are immensely proud to propose. Thank you. You government team so far is this, that while they, that they are desperately vague about the identity that evolves to fill the void. That when they say this debate is primarily about the states that in status quo have, have adopted an identity rooted in the rejection of Russian oppression in all its forms from Soviet occupation to the oppression of the Tsars, these are the states with deep histories, with deep histories that they have been forgotten, that they have deep ethnic ties that divide them, 
that in ways that do not match their borders. The states that have been able to move forward without a recourse to Russian oppression and identities and have been able to construct some kind of hyper-modern cosmopolitan ideal, like Estonia, a much better example from their side, are part of this debate. Because they've been able, they don't have the baggage of the past to weigh them down. They don't have to be bound by their identities. But the truth is, you cannot wish away those things. You cannot wish away people's allegiances to their language and their race in the countries that we are speaking about, like Georgia, like Ukraine, and so on and so forth. That's the key thing that matters in this debate. What replaces these identities, and it's an identity rooted on a rejection of oppression, of the Tsar, of the Communist Party, a superior identity to them. Firstly, some res refutation to this extraneous idea that comes out um, in, in DPM, which is the idea that we need to be able to look at our the bad parts of our history. I think this is kind of like, it, it's space value true. We ought to be critical at the point at which we can be critical. But I don't think many of these countries are at a point where you can be critical. Which is to say, criticality does not occur when there is no yeah. strong alternative that evolves to fill to fill this point. That in the presence of these of, of, of these deep historical truths that did in fact happen, that some Ukrainians were Nazi sympathizers and so on and so forth, in the absence of a uniting narrative, something that is crucially unresponded to in a their speech, so, these identities gain more power. Because you don't have a strong national narrative around which the people of Ukraine can can, can you know can, can follow behind. So then your Nazis and then your fringe elements gain more power in the contestation that then occurs about who Ukraine is or what or what, what it means to be Ukrainian in the new world. Two questions in my speech. Firstly, on what national identity matters, so well, thank you. And secondly, on geopolitics. Okay. Firstly, note that something is crucially unresponded to in Mitra's speech, which is if we grant in, on, in this debate national identity is important for the purposes of uni unity, for the purposes of a nascent nation to do things like gain support for welfare programs or get to comply with the state and all that kind of stuff, then we should grant as a key benefit <coughs> that a stronger national narrative may in some instances be worth the trade-off even if national, that national narrative is imperfect. Note that open government has inherently lost that match firstly because they are responsive to this, but secondly because they are utterly unable to articulate the alternative that then occurs. Mitchell actually does more work than these guys to tell you what might likely occur, right? He says, well, people might default to things like racial and ethnic lines, or religious lines, or whatever might, ha what might happen in all of these places with ethnic groups with long histories, even though, but note that what's important is, even if these histories might be valuable to the groups that um, hold them or believe in them, they are less recorded in the, high, in the minds of the people as a whole, then the, the history of oppression that was, that was proximate and easily remembered by people. And secondly, they are not universally held in the same way that this common experience of oppression was. So that's important because we get a stronger national identity. I think that often trades off for the sorts of benefits we talk about more than the stuff that is also existed in this debate. No. Secondly, what is this version of national identity that we think exists or can exist and how can it be inclusive to people like ethnic Russians and so on and so forth? Firstly, we describe, and again, I don't think there is a, con a real contestation of why this cannot be the case or why this is not in fact the case, that there's a version of national identity centered around resistance to oppression. Not any it's oppression, like of course. It's a very specific kind of oppression. The oppression of the Tsars and the oppressions of the communists in a moment. But note that this is important because it is not a rejection of Russian-speaking peoples um, outright. It may well be construed by some people as this, but it is not it in its inherent. Yep. Wouldn't you say that the rejection of Russian influences would also be the rejection of, for example, social values or the liberation of women within these societies? No, I, I am not sure as to why that is the case. Um, it seems like the Tsars and the communists were probably quite oppressive to many groups, and uh, uh, oppression, uh, a resistance to oppression seems to imply, as Mitra points out to you, that if your national narrative is rooted in resisting the oppressor, that you might be, firstly, more willing to support institutions that are weak that favour a resistance to the oppressor, that favour a return or construction of democracy. This is crucial in many of these states which struggle for weak institutions may well backslide in authoritarianism. Again, this is the benefit that is not responded to. If your historical narrative is rooted in resisting dictatorial oppression, you are more likely to reject dictatorial oppression when it rears its ugly head in your own nation, even if it takes a different form, even if it does not speak Russian, and it's all is of a different net, 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 um, is of a different ethnicity. The response to this is to say, well, it's possible to kind of build history day to day, build a narrative that's based on like day to day experiences and so on and so forth. I think my three and all, I already dispute this quite strongly, but note that even the example falls when you talk about the Czech Republic and how we managed to do this. The Velvet Revolution is 
with the founding myth of the Czech Republic is about a, a, a rejection of Russian oppression and throwing off the shackles of dictatorship that came yeah, prior. Yeah. Why can this be inclusive to ethnic Russians? A few things to note here. Firstly, many of these Russians in these countries who are there because they were prior, they were yeah, previously yeah. persecuted by the Tsar or communists. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, like that, is, that seems obvious that you can tell people that the Tsars and Kopp and Stalin were bad for Russians, therefore this is a more inclusive identity. We agree, obviously some people will disagree with this, but the again likely alternative that they refuse to engage with is worse for these ethnic Russians. Like they they are like but the Rus the ethnic Russians in Crimea like you with like the Russians marching in. The world in which the identities in Crimea were rooted around actually just being ethnically Crimean or, or based on identities that are not Russian is a world in which that is far more likely to happen. So I agree this is not the most inclusive version that of ethnic, ethnic Russians, but it's, it is at least one that can possibly include them, they are going to do worse. On geopolitics, note that the key thing here is that regardless of whether Russia is strong or weak, these countries ought to take firstly a position to gain relative strength relative to Russia, regardless of whether Russia is strong or weak. And the way to do this is twofold. Firstly, via unity, the common identity that Adidas speaks about, again unresponded to, allows them to get pushed back and a secure negotiating position with regards to Russia. Their main argument here here is, if you define yourself in opposition to Russia, then you cannot accept any Russian terms and Russia will hate you. This seems false based on like basic IR theory, which is that you will just do whatever is most advantageous to you. It is clearly possible to accommodate Russian terms and so on and so forth when they are not bullying, when they are not oppressive, and when they are fair to you. I think instead, the adoption of this identity makes it more likely that these states will see Russian um, negotiations as bullying where they are and as fair in, in instances where they are. They'll be, bad, they'll be more united and more able to push back in these instances. This thing is good both for these countries individually and it is good for them geopolitically. Thank So there's one thing we agree on with opening opposition, and that is the fact that national identity mostly influences internal processes within country. We accept the uh, real politic framework that says if two countries even if are, are, have a clear interest to be in, in alliance with each other, even if they have different identities, they're able to do that. The US cooperates with Saudi Arabia, yeah, yeah. Russia cooperates with Iran. We, will, uh, we generally do believe that the more main influence of this debate is on internal processes. However, there, we completely dispute what opening opposition says when they claim this is a unifying identity or a good one. I'm going to have two points. Firstly, I'm going to explain to you why liber uh, liberalism and human rights within these countries are unable to, prom to be promoted given this narrative and we believe that is the most important thing in this debate because no a stable national a strong national identity is not a good enough itself for example North Korea has a very strong national identity we don't think that is a good thing for its citizens we think that the place where that becomes meaningful where that national identity becomes meaningful, becomes meaningful is the point where it's able to provide benefits for its citizens if we show that does not happen because of this narrative then obviously that is more important secondly i'm also going to tackle them on national identity and explain why exactly the effects they want are reversed one extreme the two extremist things before that one this weird frame that says this debate is only about the ukraine we, we honestly don't think uh, yeah, yeah. there is a genius to say that in this debate or also say this on a different level when they say oh but the baltics have a different policy so they're not uh, they're not part of this motion obviously they're just a good part of this motion because they're on our on Gulf side they're doing exactly what we've said when they tell us that the baltics have great national identities they're actually stabbing themselves because they say that this is something that is plausible and can happen in many instances Second, the, uh, the, notion, the notion that says people are going to, uh, the, uh, in opening opposition, no, they, they're going to say that Russia is bad, but Russian individual people are good and the alternative is ethnic identities. No. First of all, they don't explain to us why the ethnic identity is mutually exclusive. Like, you can say, uh, we fought for a, po uh, for a Ukrainian identity, that is our ethnic identity, plus it was oppressed by Russia. I, I don't know why those things are mutually exclusive. Like, all the harms they talk about in ethnic identities seem to be at least symmetric. Second of all, we tend to claim that if you tell people constantly, Russia is bad, 
The, the, the people who oppressed you were Russian. They spoke this language. This is what you see in movies. This is the, the symbol that these people hold. Then, presumably, many people are going to think Russian people are specifically responsible, even if Owa wants them to perceive a more nuanced message. Okay. We just think that when you look at all the historical examples of how people react to the people who have oppressed them, they don't tend to be as nuanced as opening opposition was. Let's talk about liberalism and human rights. Opening government tells us that this makes it harder to have democracy. Because they, because they don't have inclusion of ethnic minorities. We obviously agree, but we think that we have, but there are significant deeper elements that we need to go into. Because national identity sets political culture. It sets with power, discourse of power, who has the power in, in media, who can be criticized, and what are the holy, the holies of holies that cannot. For example, in the US, it is very hard to criticize the Constitution, for example, because of the nation, national identity built around the founding fathers, built around democracy, and they run the Constitution. Here, why does, uh, what happens here when we make this the national identity? First of all, the people who have captured uh, power after the fall of the Soviet Union are very, very, are very easily able to claim they are the ones who have liberated the country. They were the leaders of the uh, national struggle against the oppressor. What does that mean? That means that significant, they are now the owners of national identity on opposition side of the house because the, when that identity is based around that struggle, they were the people leading that struggle. They were the savers of the nation. We're saying that makes these people significantly harder to get rid. People like Nazarbayev, for example, in, in Kazakhstan, employing that discourse, we believe is a, we believe has a major contribution to the inability to criticize them. Please be a bit more quiet for the opposition. Secondly, this, uh, se uh, but moreover, either it's a person or it's a party. We, when we look at the parties who have been uh, influential in liberating Eastern Europe from communist rule, they have hardly ever been replaced when we look. When we look at this historically, and we believe that is exactly the sort of problem. When we look, even though I know Poland is not a part of this debate, even if it wasn't part of the USSR, it exemplifies exactly those processes because it built a lot of national identity around the same issue, and you had a, you had a party that's quite irreplaceable in national politics. That means less democracy. That means less accountability of that party and that president knowing they cannot be ousted even if they do bad things for their people. Secondly, religious institutions have all have been diametrically opposed to uh, to, uh, to Soviet atheism. That means re religion gets a place, again a place of sanctity within societies. Much harder to criticize religious establishments. We're saying for uh, Eastern, uh, for Central Asian nations that might be a very important thing to go against for, against certain Islamic forces. Uh, that were seen as liberators against the Soviet Union. Uh, the, uh, then, opening opposition tells us, oh, but there's trauma from dictatorship, therefore people tend towards democracy. One, the fact that I'm against a specific dictatorial regime does not say I'm against dictatorship or against or pro-democracy. Vice versa. We say that often democracy leads to, uh, there is a notion that says of alarmism that says we are under attack, democracy is not good enough. In a state of emergency where we have to fight against an oppressor, we often go to the other extreme, not want to, be sub to have our political culture subverted to that other extreme. For example, things like, uh, for example, things like Nazi symbols being held up in crosses in Ukraine against Russia. We're saying that uh, when, you're, when your enemy is communism, you're often fascism might be seen as the solution. Secondly, a lot of times, it, the exact opposite happens for a different reason, because Russian heritage is tied, as we point out in the POI, with things like social progressivism, with things like uh, like more rights to women, with things like, for example, uh, like all these things are much more easy to be branded as communists on their side of the house. And when people espousing them are traitors. There's no need to engage with those ideas themselves. Now we say we're not propping communism, but we say social ideas, left wing ideas can be valuable in these countries. Uh, close. Yeah, why is your case not just disingenuous apologism for the Russian Orthodox Church and its family values? What? Uh, uh, so, first of all, we, uh, okay. First of all, I don't think on our side we have to. Uh, 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 there, it's likely that we'll be constructing a country that really loves Russia and the, and the, Orth the Russian Orthodox Church. We, we honestly don't know why that is compared to this debate. And when you say something about it, we'll actually be able to refute this case. Okay. National identity, quite quickly. So we say that the, what opening opposition wants is strong national identity. What is strong national identity supposed to do? It's supposed to make people rise up, uh, rise together, and pay sacrifices at a price for the uh, for co uh, collective good. However, when they define it against the, the, the reason I exist is because someone else tried to oppress me, that is a significantly weaker version of something that I'm willing to give something to. Like the government can be seen just as well as that oppressive at the point where it infringes on my rights. Like when the narrative is the reason that the state exists is because someone else has tried to, uh, has tried to take away things from me, when the government tries to take taxes from me, when the government, uh, uh, when the government calls me to service. 
That, and that one exactly, the narrative, uh, the, that government is seen as something I don't want to cooperate with, I don't want to give my forces to, which is what national identity is supposed to preserve, and we say that it's significantly worse. Proud to propose. The vast majority of this debate ignores the context that in most former Soviet states, Russia has been exerting subtle but increasing and disproportionate control. Given that it seems after the invasion of Ukraine, the very independence of these fledgling democracies is the most important issue we ought to care about, providing a counter-narrative to Russia's total domination of public discourse is the most important issue in this debate. We're going to talk about three things. Firstly, that we counteract Russia's attempts directly to control these nations. Secondly, the positive effects of democratic discourse and what people can demand from politicians. Third, how we avoid a state narrowly defined by ethnic terms and the process by which this happens, filling in the gaps for opening opposition. I'll move on to the rebuttal in an integrated manner. So firstly, how we avoid Russia's total control over these countries. What Putin seems to want to do is to exert control over the politicians and political processes within these countries. Opening up to talk about this, but then as we the process, this is the process. What Russia does is, for example, big elections, like for example, by ensuring that Alexander Lukashenko always wins in Belarus, or to hold the chair, to hold all Commonwealth and independent states countries. Secondly, to the foreign minister who heads the chairman of the council of the CIS. It props up front parties that support Russian interests. It draws political debate in the pro-Russian territory via funding RT and other extreme Russian news outlets, for example. What this has led to is an upsurge of pro-Russian sentiment in many of these countries. This is the context of the debate that we have to have. The fact that many of these countries are increasingly pro-Russian because of Russia just disproportionate exertion of total control over the airways and the media. And this deals with what the government talked about. The reason why ethnic Russians in the Donetsk are particularly pro-Russia is not because of the inherent fact that they happen to be Slavic or that they happen to be Russian. It's because RT and Russian news outlets stole the flames of discontent and victim their own to the extent that they felt that they had to support Russian interests. So that is the reason why many of these pro-Russians increasingly support Russia. What does this narrative therefore look like on the ground when we explicitly emphasize that there is a narrative that we have to stand up to Russian imperialism? First of all, it means that history textbooks will, for example, teach the nature of Russian imperialism and the mechanisms that were used to control these countries in the past, making it easier for people to spot similar patterns in the present. It means, for example, creating even a casual suspicion of Russian imperialism via Russia's increasing settlement of individuals along border areas in Eastern Europe, for example, which would make people suspicious of Russia's strategy to control democratic elections in these countries by forcing Russian economic migration into many countries in Eastern Europe. This is exactly how, for example, countries like Vietnam remain suspicious of Chinese aggression and therefore form a bulwark against China's control over the national narrative by formulating their narrative in part on the fact that there was Vietnamese resistance to Chinese aggression in the past and we need this past knowledge to inform the present. So this is very important. What did we hear from opposing government? They said that people who led the struggle against the USSR will become the power brokers, so empower the individuals and their parties. First of all, this is not clear because it seems that the prevailing problem in Eastern Europe, as we see in Hungary and Belarus, is that the leaders are too pro-Russia, not that they are too anti-Russia. So you see that just back to the vast majority of cases, this might not be true. Secondly, the comparative is that ethnic parties are more likely to dominate, and we haven't really provided yeah, yeah. a counter, in, a counter incentive for why ethnic narratives will not be the dominant prevailing narrative within many of these countries. We think that often ethnic parties can be worse because they disproportionately prioritize certain groups so, above others. Yeah, yeah. So, and on the comparative, even if we can't prove that either is worse or better, at least politicians who led the struggle so, themselves will eventually pass away or retire. That time is faded. And for example, the afterglow that the parties will have will fade out, like we saw in the ANU in South Africa, for example. So the consequence is, however, that many of these individuals will eventually lose power as compared to ethnic parties which base their foundation and their claim to the legitimacy on the ethnic basis of yeah. a country, which therefore, which are far harder to extinguish. So we need individuals in these nations to push back against the search of pro-Russian media influence. What could this kind to be look like in case you try to say that it's not possible for them to push back. First of all, it means that it's far easier for them to call out politicians for implicit political agreements and backroom deals with Russia. We think that on a face level, in terms of the democratic debate that happens in these countries, this is important because at least it introduces the specter of Russian influence as an important factor in deciding political discourse. Right. Secondly, it makes them more amenable to vote and make concessions in elections that allow them to grow closer to NATO and the West. Opening government says, and this is the only this is the only part of the debate where this analysis has emerged, America and NATO won't protect these countries, and they have not done so in the past. But they give us no system 
systemic reason to believe this. We're going to fill in the gap here. We think that NATO has a vested interest in creating geopolitical buffers in Eastern Europe. So long as states are willing to make concessions, like for example, military, min minimum military spending amounts. The moment that we allow populations to be more amenable to voting for these things is also the moment in which NATO Sir. and the European Union will take a greater interest in many of these Eastern European countries. Yes. Rely on the West and NATO to have them in Russia, tore Ukraine and Georgia in half. Central Asia accommodates Russia and not being torn in half. Why is the problem? Okay, but obviously this is a false comparative because with the vast majority of states that we're talking about, like for example the Baltic states, the European Union and NATO has a vested interest in ensuring that they remain as a buffer to Russian aggression, unlike for example Georgia. So in the specific example of the vast majority of countries in Eastern Europe, it's important that NATO still has an interest in them and we want them to make concessions such that NATO continues to have this vested interest in protecting and propping them up. We see this for example with NATO expanding increase in the eastward because they're more increasingly suspicious of the threat that Russia poses. You need to provide us with substantive reasons why necessarily NATO has no interest in being there at all. Moreover, we think that they have never really been clear about what the alternative is. Do yeah, they really yeah. want these states to fall under Russian control and lose independence? Because if that is their true alternative, then they have to say it in closing government. What we also heard from closing government was that this will empower religion and disregard progressive ideals that were created by the Soviet Union. First of all, we point out that much of the pre-Soviet imperialism that happened in these countries for many, many years was based of the explicit philosophy of the Russian Orthodox Church. It is not clear that we disempower the church rather than empower it. Secondly, it is not clear also that the USSR was actually more progressive in the realm of religious rights, or for example, gender equality, as opposed to many of the pre-USSR states. This is just an unfounded assertion. And we don't think the minutiae of whether or not the USSR was markedly more progressive than the pre-Soviet states <laughs> will become an important part of this uh, uh, intellectual discourse within many of these countries to begin with. So we don't think this is just a point that has very much impact in this debate. Moreover, we think that religious authorities are also propped up by ethnic nationalism. When, for example, the Baltic states, the Latvians, the and Estonians have a strong Christian heritage and Christian culture. So we think that they might empower religious authorities when they, when they create states Founded fundamentally on what seem to be ethnic grounds. Yeah. I'm going to this now. Why is it that states will remain in narrowly defined ethnic terms? We think that often Russian imperialism in former Soviet states predicts the USSR. Here's the thing yeah. prior to the Russian Empire, many of these states define themselves sharply in terms of ethnically homogeneous terms. Why are they less ethnically homogeneous now? First of all, because greater immigration was, of course, facilitated by the Russian Empire under the Peter the under the Soviet Union as well. And secondly, because the USSR forcibly relocated ethnic minorities between its constituent states, therefore, for example, ensuring that Azerbaijan has a sizable Christian and Muslim population. The alternative is that many of these states will be forced to construct the narrative in an ethnically defined way because that was the yeah, only yeah. way they existed prior to USSR yeah, yeah. and the Russian Empire. Meaning that people who ultimately lose out other people like the Azeris and the Kazakhs are forcibly relocated by Stalin to these states in Central Asia or Eastern Europe where they still remain a sizable minority. Therefore, there are huge harms to a non-inclusive national identity that we want to talk about. It is easier to buy into a state that is based on narrative resistance. Ultimately, government needs to justify the, the, what the alternative is, whether it's a state based on ethnic grounds or something else entirely. We're very proud of that. In closing, up. Overwhelmingly, the largest ethnic minority in the former USSR is Russian. So it is bizarre for side opposition to say simultaneously that they are the side who support ethnic minorities, while supporting policies calculated to whip up a frenzy against Russian speakers. They say, ah, oh, but we're whipping up a frenzy against Russia, not against Russian speakers. It seems un it's difficult to imagine how a campaign against, say, the Russian language in Kazakhstan, or for the removal of the Red Army monument in Kiev, cannot simultaneously be seen as a campaign against Russians and against Russian influence presently, or Russians living in those countries with both Russian and Kazakh and Ukrainian passports. So we think that is more useful. What do we provide from closing government? We provide, crucially, an analysis of what effects that the identity would have within the country, why it would lead to structural dysfunction to have an identity based around not something positive about your country, but a backward-looking identity based on a uh, former conflict which, uh, which dangerously legitimized those currently in power. So three key capital clash points, two key clash points in the speech. Firstly, liberalism and human rights. Secondly, comparison to alternatives. Before, uh, before that, some rebuttal on AA, from a late clarification, 
we think it's very clear what these states are currently doing. They focus on the existing identity of those states based on their broader history. Part of that might be what happened within the Russian Empire. Part of that might be looking back to what happened before, so the long history of the Silk Road in Central Asia, who trained to engagements with yeah, yeah. Europe, etc. It's the state of which identities it shouldn't focus on an independent struggle, which ultimately only happened uh, because the USR runs out of money in 1989. Uh, why do we think that it is, uh, this is going to, what do we think the reaction of this is going to be? We think, realistically, there are certain, Russians in this, these areas are going to react against this in such a way as they are, uh, in such a way as they are going to cause the country to destabilize. Why is this? Because when Russians see the base of their identity, when they're being told they can't speak Russian in their workplace, and therefore they're having their life even threatened, that is something which is going to lead to massive disenfranchisement with the state. Bear in mind, these Russians are technically minorities, but reasonably technically, given Kazakhstan, they constitute something like a third of the population. We also think the reaction of Putin to this sort of thing is destabilizing. Given that Putin is a, has conceived of himself as having a special duty in order to protect these people, specifically like to destabilize these states and undo any of the good things which side opposition say. Second, in terms of uh, responses to opening opposition, uh, they say that it's unifying, except for Russia, it's the largest ethnic minority. They say Russian settlers, as noted, they, Russian settlers are the product of Russian imperialism. So if you say Russian imperialism is bad, you are by definition saying these people are also um, bad. So firstly, in terms of liberalism, um, and human rights. We make four points, and we don't get we don't get a response to any of them in particular. From side, we only get a response to one or two of them, which are enormously ineffective from side uh, opposition. Firstly, in terms of the capture and fall, what, uh, the capture and uh, the capture of power by those who caused the fall. What we are told by side opposition that all these people are going to be removed anyway. We think there is an, an existing structure whereby you say if you are the party, the heirs of those who continue to embody the movement. That is when you are able to have the continuity, right, and the continuity you can pass it on to your successors. We've seen this in Turkmen and Stalin. Turkmen Bashi is able to pass on his power um, to his dentist and continue to have the uh, power in the region. Secondly, in terms of religious institutions. Notably, we say that the, um, the re religious resistance in Central Asia specifically is often very conservative Islamic, so at that point, you then, at that point, you then empower those people, you empower those people, you get a backlash within these societies. Finally, we think that, as we know, a specific dictator is able, a specific a narrative of constant oppression means you are able to uh, say that you are under attack, you therefore are unable to allow people, especially in the context where you have a large Russian ethnic minority. That creates a situation where you can say that you can't afford liberalism because you are likely to be invaded by the USSR, you are likely to be invaded by like little green men or whatever if you allow these people to have rights, and because the Russia is therefore an all pervasive threat against you, you're that you that you're therefore unable to allow people liberal rights in this way, and the result is you uh, entrench existing authoritarian regimes. And finally, in terms of Russian heritage being uniquely progressive, I think it is a fact that whilst the USSR is unsuccessful and in many ways very oppressive in some of its campaigns in uh, Central Asia, etc. It does at least mount the rhetoric and it does introduce this rhetoric and that rhetoric is therefore often persuaded portrayed as uniquely anti-Kazakh, etc. And the result is that when you default to an anti-Russian way of viewing things, um, you disempower that and you therefore don't get progress. <coughs> uh, go for it. Many of the Russian settlers in these countries are people who fled Russia after persecution in their own country. These are people who like to support an anti-Russian kind of alternative and be cooperative in these communities. Look, I, I don't know when you think these people fled Russia from persecution in their own country. Is it post-1990? Is it under Stalin? Is it under Gorbachev? The, the historical reality is these people are settled there during the Russian Empire. Some of them by force, some of them by choice. But ultimately, the, the, what's important is now that all of them feel Russian, and therefore they're likely to react against this branding and to not be part of the nation in a way which makes builds a unique dysfunctionality when you told 30% of the population that they don't truly belong to your state. What do we then get from closing opposition? Closing opposition tell us specifically that because there is this current existing threat of Russian invasion, we therefore need to uh, uh, build a mood of anti-Russian threat against that. We would say uh, two things. Firstly, that is uniquely counterproductive because what the current wave of uh, Russian aggression is a response to is specifically movements such as this. So for example, the Putin's uh, interest in Kazakhstan and the suggestion that he might annex part of Kazakhstan and Nazarbayev would resign is a, so, is a reaction against the idea that there are large numbers of Russian speakers in that area who need his protection. Secondly, we would say that, uh, so secondly, we would say that it's 
it's precisely creating that hysteria is what creates the other uh, the thing for people to react against in the first place. And finally, they never explain why, because when if people were reacting against Russia, Russia, they would necessarily react against Russia in an effective way. I, they say people are going to become more anti-Russian. What they never do is the analytical work is why being more anti-Russian means you defend the independence of your state more effectively. We would also say that realistically, these states form part of a, a kind of Russian sphere of influence by nature of their geography and economy. They say NATO will protect it. We have a president of the United States who genuinely seems to view NATO as a waste of money and to be primarily uninterested in defending the states which are already in NATO. Note that NATO's commitment to Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia is completely token and merely a tripwire. The idea that NATO is going to encompass Georgia or encompass um, Ukraine is, I think, wildly unrealistic. I can't see Trump thinking that uh, Azerbaijan, for example, is, is the ideal recruit to NATO. And therefore, if these states try and transition away from Russia, they're just likely to lose in that, uh, lose in that sense, and they're unlikely to receive the support they're banking on. Creating a population that has a foreign policy preset to oppose the country, which is realistically going to be the dominant power of the region is therefore necessarily ineffective and counterproductive. Very proud to propose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. because of its missing counterfactual. It's not enough to assert that shared Georgian culture is sufficient for nation building. Opening opposition loses this debate because they fail to deal with all these arguments of cooperating with Russia, i.e. how you keep Ukraine together. Closing government loses this debate because the good bits of their case were not extensions and the bad bits of their case was disingenuous apologism for Russian values. I'm going to talk about these things in this debate. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about why the narrative of the shared struggle against Russia is the only viable means of nation building and I'm going to impact this with minorities. Second, I'm going to talk to you about why cooperation with Russia should be guided by balanced democratic discourse and not RT propaganda. Here I'm going to do a rapid assertion that Russia is a danger to places like Kazakhstan. Third of all, I'm going to talk to you about social change and interact with Russian values and with the IL. First, on narratives of shared struggle. All does a great job in pointing out that former Soviet republics are artificial remnants of the USSR. But here's where they don't do as good a job. They don't explain to me why instinctually nations will default to race and religion. And the reason why, as Arthur told you, is because politicians have the incentive to form least available winning coalitions. Politicians in countries like Ukraine and Lithuania need to be responsive to the interests of domestic majorities and their clients. It makes sense to pander to majority Slavs or Central Asian populists as opposed to building coalitions with minority ethnic Russians who do not form a sustainable platform for the capacity for democratic sustainability. What Robin forgets when he tells you about this whole idea of identity existing in opposition is that all identity exists in opposition to other identities. It makes no sense to say, I am a Georgian, unless you also indicate through that statement that I am not some other man that is not Georgian. And a model of de-emphasizing the anti-Russia struggle entails an emphasis on excluding minority races, cultures, and languages, which ironically, guess what's really interesting, and that ironically causes minorities to be even more conscious of their own sectarian identities as a response to the increased racialism and the increased feeling of ex exclusion in these communities. So they actually create the very demons of racial and sectarian politics. So all he goes out of this debate because they never explain what the counterfactual is, right? For Robin to say we are the startup nation might resonate with someone like Arthur, but for 99% of people in Ukraine, they're not going to give a shit about that. Yeah. Closing government's extension is that, oh, but, but this means that people, despite our best efforts, default towards distrusting Russian minorities because people might be smart in government but people might be stupid in Ukraine. The response is the degree to which Russian minorities are seen as the other is directly sociologically determined by the amount of factionalism and racialism in mainstream politics. That is to say, a world in which you have a more inclusive national identity focused on shared struggle yeah, yeah. is comparatively better than yeah, yeah. a world where Russian minorities instinctually feel even closer to the Russian homeland and as a consequence face the brunt of discrimination because of that shared identity. Yeah. And now it becomes harder to, re to, to, to do that, right? And I think what underlies the argument is that the identity of a diaspora that has spent a good number of years in a foreign land is intrinsically different from the identity of someone who belongs to a homeland. Somebody who is now a Russian pioneer is actually very distinct from somebody who comes from the Russian mainland. I think that's something that closer government forgets. 
Cosine component gives a really interesting point about how it's now harder to remove an incumbent to get our claim connection to an initial struggle. Three responses. One, this fails over time as the initial occurrence of the struggle becomes more distant in the minds of the electorate. We see this happen in the Barisan National in Malaysia or the AMC in South Africa. And it's unclear why you know, this whole transmission mechanism of the guy passing on to the dentist is going to persist for the next 10 or 20 years. I agree, it's mitigation. Mm -hmm. Second rebuttal, <laughs> it is probably better to keep Russell's skeptical incumbents in place than to be pushed under the thumb of Russian propaganda. Yeah, this is weighing, I'm going to show you why we win this in my second point. Okay, my third response is that this runs into a missing counterfactual problem. Sir, I put to you that Ba'athist Iran, which was formed under a sense of shared struggle against the rest, the West, also the rest, was a lot more united and cohesive to the kind of sectarian identity that we see today, where we've got, you know, deep strife against the Shia and Sunnis in Iraq, right? But I mean, obviously it's not perfect, I know the Kurds were really, really screwed over under Saddam, but it's comparatively better. It was our case. The status quo might suck, but we make it worse, right? Second area, why cooperation in Russia should be guided by balanced democratic discourse. Arthur told you that choice is an important value in this debate. It's not about what decisions are made by the people of Ukraine and Georgia. It's rather how these decisions are made. And he told me that like, Russia would broadcast propaganda through RT, whereas Russia vote rates and supports for Russian political parties. In the face of overt Russian interference and manipulation, I think there is an imperative to equip people with an instinctual skepticism towards Russia because Russian methods are to foment an instinctual affinity towards the mainland. So we think it is impossible to counter Russia's disinformation campaigns without first building this lens into history textbooks and national narratives in the first place. Rafi tells us, I think quite intelligently, that you create the very demons you wish to foment. It is better to appease rather than anger you did. No, not distinct from what Robin told you. Our response is twofold. Response one is that Russia is of increasing geopolitical irrelevance. Its yeah, GDP yeah. is the size of Italy, its media expenditure, its military expenditure is bound up in conflict in Syria, and it decided to annex Crimea only because NATO happened to present an opportunity that will never happen again in the next 50 years. The second thing I want to point out is that the fact that Putin is going to stay in power for a long time and, the, and Donald Trump is not going to stay in power for a long time is actually an argument for our side because Putin has shown an increasing relevance to his carrot about the Russian economy, the only carrot that will allow it to exert any kind of influence over former Soviet republics. But the fact that you know Putin is going to stay there for a pretty long time and he happens to be quite a dictator and it's not going to be deposed probably isn't a, a, a good argument for their side. Okay, last area on social change and interaction with Russian values. Ayal identifies regressive elements in Central Asian republics and argues that being pro-Russia could also be... Fine, let's go Ayal. On both sides of the house, the Ukrainian identity will be ethnically Ukrainian. The only difference is whether it will, it will additionally be anti-Russian. Here we explain where that creates yes. instability and moral change. Yeah. I think it's a bit of semantic disingenuity at point here. Because what it means to be ethnic Ukrainian changes on our side. Because at the point at which you define what it means to be ethnic Ukrainian based on things like shared language and yeah, shared yeah. race, as opposed to what it means to be ethnic Ukrainian <coughs> also being defined by a shared national struggle, that changes the texture of how people view themselves in their relationship process. So I think that points some kind of semantic trick in that POY. Okay, I've got three responses, but I don't have time, so I'm going to cut that to two. One, it is unclear that the USSR was more or less progressive than the pre-Soviet states, especially because any strong progressive identity needs to be built on certain clear markers of progressivism. A brand of communism that was propped up by the KGB, the NKVD, and the ULEX probably isn't going to be a shining example of progressivism. Two, of the leaders in former Russian republics cherry-pick what values they want, i.e. the USSR probably becomes a good example and model for totalitarian control, but probably is not a good model for things like left-wing economic growth because you ran out of money on the global shop. So it's not clear on your side what your mechanism of transmitting values are. For all these reasons, I'm so proud of you. But uh, eventually, I gave the first token gov, the second to closing gov, the third to closing op, and the fourth token op. I think it is ridiculously close across each of these. I think it's helpful if I just start by explaining what OG gives us. A lot of the arguments are actually preemptive in and of themselves, and I think a lot of the arguments at all. The conclusions were rebutted, but a lot of the internal preemptions in the arguments were ignored. And I think CO especially, uh, the extension has a lot of promise, but I think it is introduced in a way that dismisses some of the preemption to this extension from OG, and that's why it became less persuasive to me. And I'll explain what I mean. NCG does capitalize on this. So, 
Um, opening gov. I mean, to address the point of a counterfactual, like fair enough, I think the gov bench could have been a bit clearer about what the counterfactual looks like. I don't think this is a hard burden. I think oh, oh it is fair for you to suggest that things could get worse, but you're also a, a bit vague in how you think this would happen. I think CO gave me a reasonably convincing case for why it might be more, uh, why the country might be more divided along ethnic lines, but it's also unclear to me why the countries would be worse off as a result, or why their relationship with Russia would be worse off as a result, and everyone seems to agree that their relationship with Russia does matter here. So, anyway. Um, I don't think the counterfactual is a deal breaker in the city. I think it's really a decision. So what does OG say? OG goes, look, we have enough history outside of this like exchange between Russia and these countries. We have a modern identity. Uh, there are other bases of similarity. Okay, fine. They give us several things. So one they say, having an oppositional perspective of this sort forecloses certain forms of interaction with Russia immediately. And it structures the political discussions such as some things are off the table, right? So we're inclined to view their actions as threatening, and we're not likely to negotiate or act friendly towards them in any way. This is bad because we can't rely on anyone else, and sufficient claims are provided for why NATO and the US are not reliable. This is challenged. Um, so I think where some of their analysis is ignored is when they talk about the incentive structure of Russia. I'm not saying they're correct or they're telling the truth necessarily, but in this debate, it's always a whole causation thing. What causes Russia to behave this way? Are they inherently like this and therefore we must react to them? Or are they reacting to what we are doing? And they give us a, a, a clear narrative from their side. Their narrative is Russia's imperialistic actions are a result of provocation from our end. Every time they do the provocations you say they are doing, it's a result of worry that these countries they care about seem to be getting closer to the West, right? And because we signal hostility. When these countries stop signaling hostility, Russia is in a position where it will respond favorably to these overtures because it's economically weak, or this is the reason they give, right? Well, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's a fair, ex fair logical explanation. And I think this is where CEO suffers, because you come in and you go, Russia bad, doing all these bad things, and like, yeah. And you're like, we need to counterbalance against these bad things, and like, this is true, but first you need to tell me why Russia doing these bad things is not worsened by the fact that we are signaling hostility to it. And you know what, there could very well be a reason for why not. Like Putin might just like, like maybe this is why this is his way of consolidating power internally by projecting like a strongman image to the rest of the world. Like I don't know, but that needed to be dealt with before I could be persuaded of the causal relationship, right? So that bit of their case that Rafi brings back in the whip speech quite compellingly, and again, that needed to be dealt with. The next is, um, also, same, same criticism of all, right? Um, the next in terms of the Russian minorities, to be fair, I don't think anyone really compellingly wins this in the debate. My intuition is that Prof. Bench is probably slightly more convincing here. So they go, if you have a, if you have baggage with Russia, that's going to translate to cultural symbols, to language, to people on the ground. A lot of them are native to the area. Um, and our proof of this is the fact that these people are increasingly resentful of the dominant communities. They feel threatened and sympathetic to Russians, and Putin on many situations have used, has used them officially as an excuse to do bad stuff. The argument of the is like, no, this is a bit more nuanced. Some of them are actually oppressed, and people are capable of making a distinction between Russian oppressors, the Tsars, and all of that, and these people on the ground. I think, I think Prop is reasonable in saying people are less able to make these distinctions on the ground, and at the very least, the people who are in a position to shape these forces do not make these decisions. Even Putin doesn't make this decision, right? Uh, I am persuaded a bit by CEO saying, but in this counterfactual, which yes, I am persuaded may happen, where we have more ethnic and regionalistic lines, these minorities could also be screwed, potentially a little bit more screwed. And at the end of the day, I was asking myself, even if I accept that CEO is correct, and I accept that the situation of these minorities is still slightly worse, I still don't think you're winning the debate about changing Russia's behavior. So the minority thing isn't where this debate turned for me. Um, in terms of what it does to democracy, I, I think CG brings a lot in this debate. Uh, what I get from OG is, 
it demonizes elements of society with a valid political agenda like anti-corruption just by virtue of association with Russia, which is state like which is unproductive for democracy. Plus, it becomes harder for countries to be critical of their own complicity in historical crimes. Harder, to, uh, it, it's difficult to not repeat them. Um, what I get from CG here, uh, which I don't think like is really dealt with, is the danger of what you want is that these countries feel like they're in a constant state of threat, so that they feel like they must always collectively mobilize against Russia, and like this is essential to being in a position of strength against Russia. The implications of those domestically is that local authoritarians capitalize on this discourse then to justify anti-democratic practices, because we're always in a constant threat. Perhaps we should be ultra-nationalist. Perhaps fascism is the solution, uh, which I think is again very reasonable and like well-supported warrant in the round, right? So I don't think this is dealt with. Um, my straight answer for why I had OG above CG in this debate is I just think OG put a lot more material on the table. Your material is compelling. They had a lot more. It was equally compelling. A lot of the links were well made in the OG case, and you relied on some of those links to uh, dispute off page. I found it persuasive, but then those things already did come from them. Um, I, I found the enabling local dictators argument a bit coarse. I, mean, I, I do think they, they cast enough doubt on the religions and progressive values part of the case. Um, opening up, uh, so fair to say they have no counterfactual, also not persuaded why the counterfactual is what you say it is, right? I just wanted to hear more about this whole preventing a back, backsliding into a dictatorship thing, uh, this belief that you, you always need to be a you always need to be afraid of uh, trauma of oppression. I do think they turned this on you quite effectively by saying that then it just allows local parents to demonize external oppressors to justify local tyranny. Again, here, we, this whole Russia does bad things and we need to bargain from a position of strength, or like these countries need to all feel like they are threatened so that they will collectivize. Fair enough, but if we can minimize Russia's belligerence, by not threatening it in the first place, which is their assertion. Why is there a need for that? So I need an independent explanation for why Russia is just like always a threat, regardless of what we do. Therefore, we are better off always being on guard. And this really system applies to both, right? Mm. Um, this bit in your speech, I think, has a lot of potential and doesn't get developed, because Robin goes, uh, it becomes very difficult to decide to negotiate with Russia or play ball with them sometimes if you are so oriented to viewing them as the enemy and you're like, no, why are rational people cooperate with people they agree with? What I wanted to hear a bit more about that. Uh, giving it partial credit, but at the same time, I'm like, I, in this context, would have wanted to hear a bit more about that. How would it play out in these countries, right? Um, so like I said about closing off, I, I think we deal with the progressive values point quite well. So the war heroes point, I give you partial credit. You are correct, it's mitigatory, but I have another concern about it, which is, so you're saying they're going to fail throughout time, which may well be true for Malaysia and some of these places, but is that going to happen while simultaneously enacting your policy of actively referencing Russia as the enemy and liberation and freedom from Russia as the best thing that happened to your country? Mm. Is that still, is that appeal still likely to fail? Mm. And I, I don't think it's a contradiction at all, and I wish this had been like argued more aggressively, but at the same time, I just also felt like um, I would have wanted to see how this plays out more concretely. Like, can you have it both ways in your case? And if not, I mean, I still don't think it kills your case that these people are elected regularly. It does, it does strengthen a bit the democratic deficit point. My biggest criticism is, the Russia point you're trying to make, that we need to safeguard against it, be vigilant against it, be able to detect the ways in which it influences debates, reads debates and discussions, all fair and good. I just need to be to engage with them saying this only happens when they feel better. Mm -hmm. That's really it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you have any other questions, chat with me. Thank you. Um, um, one question?